Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening at the President's Dream Colloquium on Making Knowledge Public. My name is Juan Pablo Alperin. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Publishing in the Faculty of Communication Arts and Interactive Technology, as well as an associate director with the Public Knowledge Project both here at SFU. And tonight and for the next 12 weeks, uh, I am also the chair of the President's Dream Colloquium. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to invite Elder Margaret uh, to the podium to provide a traditional welcome. Elder Margaret uh, is from the SFU Elders Program. Elder Margaret. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Are you awake? <laughs> I think you're all taking a nap right about now. So welcome to the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisleiwatus, and the shared territory in Vancouver. If you're new to Vancouver, Musqueam is out towards UBC. Uh, Squamish is just across from the Lions Gate up to Upper Squamish, and my little reserve is just over past Second Arrows Bridge. And uh, I've been with SFU going on 18 years, which is, um, I think, the longest job I've ever held. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're not union. We're just... <laughs> let you know that. <laughs> so uh, welcome to this evening. And a very short prayer to get your your uh, event going. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Just guide us in our words and our thoughts and our actions, letting us always remember that we are the leaders and the mentors of those who follow us, those who witness what we do and what we say. I ask Great Spirit to bless each and every one of you, thanking the community from where you come from and your families for the time that you miss with them and just a very special blessing on this evening on my relations. Thank you, Elder Margaret. Now I'd like to invite the president of Simon Fraser University, Andrew Petter, to say a few words. Andrew. Well, thank you very much, uh, Juan Pablo, and thank you, Elder Margaret, for that greeting. We are indeed privileged to be gathered on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I'm just delighted to be here for the start of this semester's President's Dream Colloquium on Making Knowledge Public. The President's Dream Colloquium is uh, a wonderful uh, set of events that I always enjoy because it brings together faculty from different parts of the university to create a series of speakers, uh, uh, presentations on topics that are of wide interest, not only to the university community, but to the general community. And the colloquium was really set up very much to reflect our vision to be an engaged university, a university that connected different disciplines, different ideas, and shared knowledge, not only within the university, but within the broader community. So it's great to have this lecture starting this series taking place at the Vancouver campus, and I know that's meant that uh, a number of people from the broader community have been able to, to join us. But you should know the colloquium is also a uh, course within the university. It provides for students an opportunity to not only learn from great speakers and faculty, but to learn from each other, because. This year, we have about 20 students enrolled in the Dream Colloquium, and they come from all over the university, from sociology and anthropology, from biology, education, geography, and many other disciplines. And those students get the opportunity to share their perspectives from those different disciplines, those different areas of uh, study, with each other. And in fact, uh, in the past, some students have uh, described the Dream Colloquium as a field school without having to leave the campus and a great learning environment filled with eager students. So I do want to thank the students who've enrolled in this program. I think you're in for a real treat uh, with this colloquium. And part of that treat, of course, begins this evening to be able to hear from a leading speaker on the topic of making knowledge public. The uh, dream colloquium wouldn't happen uh, without the uh, creativity and commitment of faculty members who are courageous enough to put forward a proposal 
and then have to roll up their sleeves and put together the speaker series, the program, the topics, and the course that's associated with it. And we've had some very dedicated faculty do that in the past, and we have faculty this time who are no less dedicated, including our colloquium chair, Juan Pablo Alperin from the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology, Nancy Oweiler from the School of Public Policy, Dan Leitch from the Faculty of Education, Vance Williams from the Department of Chemistry, and Gwen Bird, who's the University Librarian and Dean of Libraries. And I know that they also have drawn on many others to help out in this. The colloquium is also supported by the uh, Graduate Studies Office, and I do want to acknowledge Stevie Benish and Stacy uh, Makadorf uh, of the Graduate Studies Office, as well as Dean and Associate Provost Jeff Dirksen for helping to oversee and organize this event. The topic that we're looking at is certainly a timely one. The topic of how information gets shared, uh, how we access information, uh, the uh, question of uh, how we as a community uh, interact with each other based on information that is or is not available, and how reliable that information uh, is. These are all important issues. And we, as an engaged university, of course, believe very much that universities have an important role to play in providing the public with information on which uh, the public can make decisions based upon evidence and influence public policy. So I think this topic, uh, looking at knowledge and how knowledge uh, can be shared and, uh, and, and processed, is a very, very important one. And we're honored this evening to host Dr. Jevin West, who will speak on calling BS on fake news, although I will say the term BS is a contracted form of the actual title, as you will know. <laughs> My staff said, Andrew, you've got to use BS. Um, I'm reminded of that line that Groucho Marx used with Margaret Dumas. He said, uh, I'm trying to protect your honor, which is more than you've ever done. So that's what my staff, <laughs> that's what my staff are doing with me. In any event, I know it's going to be a very timely and provocative uh, uh, talk, and I encourage you not only uh, to, 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 uh, to, to listen attentively this evening, but please come back and uh, participate and listen to the rest of the series. It's also uh, available through webcast, and it provides a wonderful opportunity for us to learn together, to share together, and to uh, benefit from some fabulous speakers. And with that, I'll turn the podium back over to Juan Pablo so he can uh, introduce tonight's guest speaker. Juan Pablo. Before I get to introducing our speaker, I do want to tell you just a little bit about some of the other talks in the series, uh, mostly by way of enticing you to come to them as well. Uh, but also, if you'll allow me, I want to tell you a little bit about the course that we're doing alongside of it, which in the spirit of the colloquium, we are also trying to make public and to uh, participate in the act of making knowledge public. Tonight's talk is going to provide framing for the whole series. Um, you're all here, so I assume that you, have, uh, you agree that we have some problems with misinformation. Uh, and I hope that tonight's talk, and in fact, I hope that the whole series altogether, uh, sort of compels us to do more to insert research, knowledge, uh, and facts and truth into the public sphere in more purposeful ways. We propose this colloquium under, uh, for, because of a fundamental belief that uh, everyone has a right to access to knowledge. And we believe that universities sort of have a responsibility to enshrine that right. This colloquium has given us an opportunity to, to have an extended conversation about what each of us can do to serve the public through our intellectual pursuits, while simultaneously, through the colloquium itself, demonstrating the value, that, uh, the public value of everything that we do at the university. To fulfill sort of this lofty goals, we have another five talks coming up, which I hope to see all of you at. Each intersects with different dimensions of what it means to make knowledge public. The next talk will be on the theme of research and government. We will have a talk from the president of one of the three government agencies that fund research so that we can better understand how the academic community and government agencies sort of work in tandem to bring about social change. Our following two talks in October will discuss from very different perspectives ways of engaging the public in the research process. One of those talks will be on ways of engaging in reciprocal and collaborative research between indigenous communities and researchers. And the second will be the role of citizen scientists can play to help address social justice issues, uh, sorry, environmental justice issues. I hope that these talks remind us that making knowledge public is not just about academics sharing the knowledge that we have public, but rather about creating knowledge together with and for the communities that we're a part of. 
This will help us to think about community in, in, in more broad terms and to think about uh, with our fifth talk, which will be on the global participation in knowledge production. We, as we get on board, when we all come to an agreement about the idea that sharing research and knowledge and making it more accessible is a good thing, this talk is gonna help us to think about um, who gets to set the global research agenda? Who gets to participate in creating research? And on whose terms do they get to do this with? Finally, we'll circle back on a fifth talk that will help us to think about the role of the university. Can making knowledge public through open education, open access to research, through other open practices, help to contribute to our efforts to articulate the public mission of the university? I'd like to think so, but of course I'd like to think so. I'm chairing a colloquium on making knowledge public. Uh, uh, but in the class, and like I do in all of my classes, and I'm, we're going to be doing in this class, where we have about 20 students, many of whom are sitting near the front row here, um, uh, we are going to be practicing making knowledge public. They're going to be making annotations, online commenting that are publicly available on every readings that they do in the class. And for their assignments, they're going to be doing different forms of public scholarship, such as blog posts, submitting op-ed pieces, podcasts, uh, commenting on news stories, Wikipedia pages. And also, we're inviting all of you to join along. You can read. The syllabus will be available. So will the annotations of the students. We invite you to um, come with us on this journey in having, coming to a shared understanding of the ways and the value of making knowledge public. So enough promo and enough uh, advertising the coming talks. We have a terrific speaker lined up, as well as two wonderful respondents that are going to join us afterwards for some brief thoughts on tonight's talk and to help us kick off a discussion in which we'll invite all of you to participate. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jevin West, an assistant professor in the Information School at the University of Washington, and the co-founder and co-director of the Data Lab. With his colleague, Carl Bergstrom, he developed a course on calling bullshit. I will not use the abbreviated form uh, for combating misinformation. Uh, I just don't have any staff to stop me from doing these things. Uh, uh, his uh, course has a particular emphasis on data, figures, uh, visualizations, and statistics. The course, whose syllabus actually is also available online, as, as, as are some of the lectures, uh, is now being taught at universities around the globe. The course sort of rooted out of his core research agenda on the science at, of, and of studying the science of science, where he asked questions about the origins of scientific disciplines, the social and economic biases in sciences, and the impact of publication models on the health of science itself. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jevin West. So I first want to thank Juan Pablo. If I was making one colloquium, um, this is the, the topic of making knowledge public. I think it's just, it's, it's timely and uh, you know, both in that I think we're making success uh, around the world, um, but with it comes challenges. Uh, we're all asked now to be producers of information, not just those on universities, consumers of the information and also the gatekeepers. We can't just depend on these well-trained journalists as our gatekeepers. And it's, so it's a challenge and we'll talk a little bit about those challenges as well. I also want to um, call out and thank my colleague, who's a co-conspirator in some of the work that we're doing, um, and, and also just, just point to all, the, there's lots of other work that we're building on. Like many of these ideas, we're building on ideas from other people. So let's get started, and, and hopefully we'll have a fun conversation um, today. So I think we all know that we're drowning in BS. We're, you know, we know that our politicians in all countries are sort of um, unconstrained by facts. Even in science, I've had a love affair with science ever since I was young, but even here, scientists and science are sometimes complicit in the sensationalism um, that's coming out of university presses, and that's sort of for another lecture. But higher education, we all know this. If we've been students in higher education, we know that when that essay is due at you know, 11 a.m. and we're starting it at 2 a.m., we know we have to filter it with lots of, with lots of BS. Um, so we're sort of almost complicit as educators as, to, as well. And in Seattle, I hear startups, and I love the energy of startups, but they're sort of, they sort of elevate it to new, to new levels. But there's, there are parts of society where we've always known, like ad advertisers just feed it to us just straight up. And as I sort of am getting more into administration, um, I sort of make some of my, fun of myself that activity amounts to sophisticated exercise in the combinatorial reassembly uh, of, of, of BS. But, but here's the world that we live in now, is that the average American we know spends nearly an hour a day on Facebook doing what? Mostly spreading BS. So we know this, our students know this, the public knows this. We know that our, inf our environments, our information environments are insincere and they're unreliable. And a lot of times that unreliability and that insincerity doesn't really matter. They're minor sort of annoyances in our everyday digital life, which is where we spend probably 50% of our lives now. But it's stories like this that start spreading. 
So this was a real news, well, it wasn't a real news story, but it was a news story that was published by AW News claiming that the Israeli defense, mini that the, um, Israeli defense minister was threatening Pakistan. So I'll just sort of highlight the sort of key part of that particular news story. And it said that they will destroy this country with a nuclear attack on any sort of, uh, with any sort of, uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of pretext of moving into to Syria. The problem is, is this was fake news. It was taken down. If you go to this website, you'll receive a 404, which just says the website's down. It's you know, indisputably fake news, if we want to call it. And I'm going to use the word fake news today. It's a very loaded term, and we have to be careful within academia how we use the term, but just for fun today, let's use it. The problem, <laughs> the problem here is that that particular item wasn't taken down soon enough. The defense minister of Pakistan took it as real news and tweeted out the following. Israel forgets that Pakistan is a nuclear state too. So you have this sort of sword rattling threat based on an information item that was created likely to get clicks. And clicks result in money and maybe it's prop there are other reasons for why fake news is created. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But the point here is that if defense ministers, leaders of our world are making decisions and, do, and, and sort of um, executing actions that could threaten sort of the uh, sort of <laughs> the sort of world preservation. Um, we, I see this, and I think a lot of us see this as an existential threat, especially if we care about democracy, because democracy depends on collective decision making and collective dialogue. And we are seeing the kinds of data that should sort of give us pause. So many of you may have seen this. This is by, by Craig Silverman, where he looked at the number of engagements in the prior to the U.S. presidential election in 2016. He looked at the 19 mainstream media outlets and the number of engage, engagements on Facebook were things like likes and posts and comments and compared them to fake news that we know has been refuted. Fake news prior to the election, three months prior, according to his data, and we would want to look into that, we'll talk about data and how that can sort of tell different stories. But according to this data, let's take it at face value, that there were more engagements with fake news than there was real news. This is also coming out of the research community. This was a, uh, uh, an article that was published on the cover of Science. Within Science, this is one of the premier outlets, and, and it really does receive, not always, but it does receive pretty serious, rigorous peer review. And the, uh, the main take home from this article was that if you look at false rumors and true rumors, and they use Snopes data, so Snopes is a fact checker, and what they did with this data is they then tracked it and, and wanted to ask, they asked a simple question. They said, does False rumors travel faster than true rumors. What they found, and others need to follow up on it, but that false, false news and false rumors seem to travel faster. They're engineered to do that sort of thing, so it shouldn't be that surprising. And we could dig in and see if there's um, sort of maybe some selection bias issues, but the point here is that false news travels fast in our new environment. But it's not just news. Um, it's not just media where a lot of this information, this false information, is finding homes and festering. In the US, we've had a lot of debate around net neutrality. It's this idea of, of what we do with the bandwidth and who can control and what rules are coming out of government. And what we found, or what, what happened recently during that debate, was that there were many, many comments going to the FCC, many of them, probably you know, hundreds of thousands likely. But what many found out later was that many of those comments were bots. And that sort of takes out the dialogue with the public and the leaders that they elect. And that doesn't get enough news. This is the thing that actually scares me as much as all the fake news that's traveling around our media channels. And so it's coming in many different forms. But the forms that scare me the most, aside from sending bombs based on fact, fake news, is the health news that's traveling, some purposely and some sort of by honest mistake. But I just recently talked with, uh, at a dental conference, a research conference, and they're having major problems fighting against this, this, this false news that's going around that fluoride's killing our kids. This was passed, if you look at the bottom, by InfoWars. Alex Jones, the head of InfoWars, has been pushing this like many of the other kinds of false news that's passing around. If you've never heard about Alex Jones, he's been in the list. Um, the one sort of positive thing about this discussion with the dental community about this, which is similar to a lot of the issues um, general in health around vaccinations, for example, that one I could talk for hours and hours about, um, going back to the Wakefield paper in 1998. 
But the one good thing that came out of the dental conference is that they came up with the best term that I've, I've heard, at least in this space, is that they're having some serious truth decay. All right. <laughs> So I, that I gave them that, and I got to use it, but I give them credit for that. All right, so um, let me tell you about the most important principle in bullshit studies, if such thing exists. I'm actually putting it on my CV now. I'm not just putting you know, um, science of science and computer science and data science. I put uh, BS studies. And that is Alberto's BS asymmetry principle. And I think it's really important. It comes back time and time again in what we're seeing in these studies that I mentioned from science where false news travel faster, that the amount of energy necessary to refute BS is, much, is an order of magnitude. I would say orders of magnitude more uh, bigger than it is to create it. In our environments today, it's so easy to create fake news. And there's not a lot of repercussions. Not to say that we necessarily need laws around this, but it's easy. I can do it in my, um, you know, in my pajamas and uh, you know, on a couch. And if it gets enough clicks, it makes me money. But trying to refute the false news passing around about vaccinations, for example, can cost kids lives. So what's going on here? I'm going to talk about, eventually, like as, as Juan Pablo had mentioned, sort of the core contribution of the class and the research that we're doing is specifically around false news that gets clothed in data and graphics and sort of the veneer of authority that comes around data. But I'm going to talk a little bit, if you'll give me a chance for the next 10 minutes or so, around sort of the history and sort of the environment in which we live um, in today, in 2018. Now, there's been, a, there's been a lot of advances in the ways that we store information, the way we share it, the way we transmit it. Um, which are, are similar, and we've had this sort of, uh, sort of jumps in technology, whether it was from hieroglyphics to sort of, you know, the, just the word from the major church leaders at certain times in history, although at those times th there was control on what was said, who got to read it, um, the, the content. Then there was this sort of rise of the, I'm sort of blasting through the rise of misinformation. Uh, we give, uh, uh, Carl and I talk about this in multiple lectures, so I'm condensing it into about a slide and a half, but I want to make a point here in just a second. That you have this, at this time when the sort of the availability of creating your own content, that was a big deal, where anyone who had access to a computer could create information. But now we live in this world in sort of post Web 2.0, where everyone, like I said at the beginning, is now the gatekeeper. And that's a huge task given the, the onslaught of misinformation or information in general that we're given. So we look at today, what we like to do is we ask, what is different today than it was in previous times where there was advances in information technology? And again, we could talk about this for a long time, but let me give you some really interesting quotes from different time periods when there was major advances in information technology. One person that thought about this really deeply, uh, and you look at this, is any, if anyone's read Neil Postman's work, he had this quote, and he said in one of his books, the invention of new and various kinds of communication has given a voice and an audience to many people whose opinions would otherwise not be solicited and who in fact have little else but verbal excrement to contribute to the public <laughs> issues. So I have a question for everyone out there. When was this quote published? Just give me a decade. Darn it, you guys are good, because you know when Neil Postman was publishing most of his work. <laughs> to me, when I read this for the first time, it sounded like that could apply just as easy today. They could have been talking about Facebook. They could have been talking about our current epidemic of misinformation. But he was talking about that. Good job. I, you would get points on a quiz on that one. 1969. But let's go back even further. And the reason why I want to show these quotes, because I do have an alarmist, a little bit, tone throughout this talk. And this is one of the one section in the talk where I say, OK, it's happened before. So let's go back a little bit further to 1474 when um, Filippo de Strada was really worried about this thing called the printing press. And here was the quote, writing indeed, which brings us gold for us, should be respected and held to, the no to be nobler than all goods unless she has suffered degradation in the brothel of the printing press. <laughs> he was comparing the printing press to a brothel because he was concerned about that excrement that, that Neil Postman was talking about centuries after that. We've had, we've gone through this before, and there is worry, and it worries me. I, I lose sleep on it, um, about especially information that has to do with health and sort of world preservation and democracy. 
But we've been through it before, and I think we'll get through it again. Although my colleague, Carl, is much more of a pessimist on it. He thinks we're going to hell in a handbasket soon. Um, <laughs> but what's, what's sort of driving today? What's different today? And sort of I, before I sort of even show you the next slide, think in your head for a second. What is different today than maybe in Filippo de Strada's time? What's different today? Let me give you some of my thoughts, and you'll have thoughts, and maybe we can discuss them during um, the discussion afterwards. Well, I think there's always been economic incentives to push in for misinformation and propaganda. Propaganda has been around forever, of course. We know that. But the economic incentives get rewarded fast today. The way that the, 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 the payment system and the marketing system and the click sort of driven models that are run by places like Google, you can get payment for clicks fast. That's why you can have superstars on YouTube that do nothing but leave, don't even leave their couch and they can make millions of dollars because of those clicks. Uh-oh, something happened. I needed an update here with managed software <laughs> with this computer. Let's see, let's switch back. Okay, there we go. All right, we do have hostile state actors, and that's always been around, and, and, and all countries are sort of guilty of it, but they have at their disposal a set of tools in social media that are more powerful in terms of speed and ability to spread and to hide them in these echo chambers like never before. And we could discuss, maybe we'll discuss that later on. Maybe you disagree with me. But what's going on with the hostile actors, it's not just a one-sided argument. What they're doing is they're sowing discord and noise into the system. They're sowing what a lot of researchers are calling disinformation. And as Gary Gasparov said in 2069, better than I could, of course, is that the point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda, it's to exhaust your critical thinking. It's to make you tired, exhausted, and that's the way to annihilate truth in truth and in the institutions that we, re we sort of um, rely on um, in these um, open democratic societies. Now, one of the things that sort of has been the ire for me for a long time has been this lack of reporting of all the fake accounts. And I'm not the only, a lot of people have been talking about this for a long time. That social media, if there's one area to regulate them, it's in getting them to report the number of bots and fake accounts and machines that are out there pushing public opinion around. Finally, over the last year, because of public sort of push on and Congress, at least in the US and other countries as well, Facebook, Twitter, Google, et cetera, are having to come to the table. And they are now saying things like, well, I guess maybe we have, that went from sort of maybe hundreds, thousands of fake accounts to now, you know, then Russian influence reaches 126 million to if you are following this subject, probably the most, well, a number that should stick in your head just a couple days ago, 1.3 billion accounts were deleted by Facebook, reported by Facebook in front of the US Congress a couple days ago. 1.3 billion. They claim 2 billion, which is great for investors. Sounds good. But if you're deleting 1.3 billion, that might be something that the rest of the public should know about. But it's not just bots. Now, I could talk about bots, and I think bots are a big part of the problem. But we have real people behind fake accounts. So Jenna Abrams was the typical American girl for a long time. But she had about 70,000 to 100,000 followers. Many of the things that she was saying, was they were landing in national media outlets. Well, long story short, Jenna Abrams was being run by about three IRA, IRA um, real people. Um, this is the Internet Research Agency out of Russia. And again, I sort of give Russia examples, but there's other examples, and even U.S. has done this sort of, uh, you know, other countries have been known, but it's not just bots. A lot of the conversations around bots, there's also, there's such investment in this that there's real people in these so social media um, worlds. We also have this real issue in the U.S. and across, and I'm sure in Canada as well, where we're getting these news deserts, where local newspapers, I'm a huge fan of local news, and that local news is being aggregated into sort of national, or well, actually not even aggregated, sort of just going extinct. And I think that's a real, it's, it's a real problem if we want to um, sort of combat this. And I don't know how the solution for it, but the fact is this is an alarming, and this is not even the right graphic because there's much worse graphics that show worse things. But in these environments, in the digital environments in which we really live, most of the time, 
you have the, we used to live, they used to be sort of driven by subscriptions. And with that, you sort of gave me the money if I was the newspaper, and I, for a year, what I would do is I would do my best to provide a sort of product that you could sort of trust and that you would um, subscribe in the following year. But now journalists have to live by the click. They have to go back to their editor and they have to say, well, this story, I put a lot of love into it and I think it's super important. It only had you know, 10,000 views. And the editor looks at that person and says, you need to get more views. So what do you do? You create more sensational headlines. You create ways of, of getting more and more of those clicks when should, is that the best thing for democracy and even journalism? And they know this too. Journalists have been aware of this. And the point here is that the unvarnished truth, that unvarnished truth is just simply not good enough anymore when you have other things to catch your attention, like, you know, seven kittens that look like Robert De Niro. Or, or you know, in this case, you know, there's something hidden in the Hershey's logo and it'll rock your world. Now, how could you not click on that? I would click on that, too. Um, that's just too cool. And actually, there's been, some, there's been some nice research looking at the kinds of terms, if you looked over many, many, many media uh, headlines that have these kinds of things. And well, you know what the most common thing, this is really interesting research you find in these headlines that are grabbing your attention. This was done by, um, at Bazuma, Baz, Bazumo. Um, the first one was, we'll make you. This was a common like three word phrase that was found in so many of these click pulling headlines. Will you, or this is why, can you guess? Only X in, the reason is, are you freaking out? These are the kinds of things that this, is, this would pull you at. Now, the other big problem, of course, is the consumer, of course. Um, and there are studies, of course, here, 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. That's depressing, 70%. The problem is this particular story, if you actually clicked on this story, like it was reporting on, you would have found random text, <laughs> Laura Mipson. And I've been sort of, my colleagues and I, we've been tracking this particular story and others like it, and guess what? The likes keep going up and up and no one's <laughs> clicking on the actual story. So this is a problem. We actually have to read past the headlines, but that's tough when you, you're giving lots and lots of, mis or, or lots of information um, thrown at you on a daily basis. There's been some really depressing news coming out of you know, Pew Research Center. For example, this study was showing that regardless actually of left or right leaning, or you know, all, they looked at all sorts of variables, the big take home here was that many of those that they, they tested and surveyed could not tell the difference between fact stories and opinion-based stories. And that, right now, that tells me we need to do a better job in education, especially at the high school level. There's other things, and I won't get into this, but this one's what, this is getting more at the core of my expertise and sort of where I try to teach students, is that in news, you find that there's always this sort of, this need to jump to causation. And everyone hears this, and I hear this from students, as soon as I start talking about correlation causation, they go, oh, I've heard this before, correlation does not, ca does not necessarily imply causation, and they sort of put their head down, and they look at Facebook or something. And I say, wait a minute, this is one of the, one of the more difficult things for information consumers, and many people have shown this, and we could spend the entire class just on this issue, and I think if we could get this down, in education, we would be smarter consumers. And here's just a recent story talking about the adverse effects of high income prices, how they correlated with fewer babies. Now, they did mention in the story, this came out of Zillow Research, this is a real estate online company. Um, and like many of these stories, they say, of course, correlation doesn't equate to causation, and other factors could be prompting millennial women to delay or forego children. But if you look at these headlines, they're prescriptive and they're different than what they're saying. They're always trying to sell the causation because those sell newspapers, not correlation. Here's another issue. This, this idea that we're forgetting that empirical methods are useful, sort of looking out and observing and depending on something that might resemble fact, gets pushed aside to tribal membership. And this idea of tribal epistemology, I think, is a core reason about what's going on. That information is evaluated based not on conformity to common standards of evidence or correspondence to any sort of common reasoning or understanding of the world, but on whether it supports the tribe's values and goals is foul-shaped by tribal leaders. Good for, the, good for the side and true begin to blur into one. 
This membership to tribe, I think, is a, is a real, it's a hard thing to combat. And um, that, you know, is going to take sort of almost cultural change. So let's see. So what, what do we do about it? So I've talked a lot about some of the problems, and there's many, many others. And hopefully we'll get to some more in the discussion. But what do we do? Well, if I could summarize it in one slide, and of course this isn't enough, we just simply need to think more and probably share less. <laughs> if there was just one thing we can do, this would be the simplest, you know, four, uh, le uh, four words, but that's of course harder, it's easier said than done. There are lots of countries right now that are experimenting with laws. Uh, um, Macron and uh, Sweden and Malaysia and many countries have been proposing laws uh, 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 or uh, outlawing fake news. The state of California in the US was one of the first states to propose a bill outlawing fake news. And I think the intentions are good here, but it concerns me. In the US, we really care a lot about the First Amendment. This is, this is free speech. And as much as I hate fake news and as damaging it can be, this can be a slippery slope. So I think we have to be careful about how we sort of wrap laws around fake news because a, one leader just might not like what he or she is reading and one day down the, few, down the road might decide that everything that's against what they're saying is fake news. Now we look at, um, we look at uh, the, the, some of the work that's um, going on in other countries. I, I think in terms, you know, this, this thing called GDPR, many of you may have never heard of it, this is this general data protection regulation that just went in place in Europe. I think it's a big deal. And it's this idea of protecting your, mis your information. I'm not going to go into the details of GDPR, but I'll, I'll give you just one just sort of uh, example so you don't think it's this, re I mean, it's complicated legislation, of course, but it's not that complicated. Things like if your data is stolen, within 72 hours, you should be notified. Now, I think that's pretty reasonable, right? And there's many of these sort of reasonable um, uh, sort of laws that are being put in place to protect your information. And the reason why I think it's related to misinformation is that some of those same principles that are guiding GDPR could be some of the same principles we could use at least as guides when we talk about some forms of um, potential regulation in the, sp in the space. Now, in my state of Washington, just across the, the Canadian border, in the state of Washington, we were the first state in the, the, the Union, United States Union, to require now media literacy in high schools and middle schools. And I think that's the sort of, there's a lot of things our state's not doing right. This is one thing I think it is doing right. And, and I think others are starting to follow, at least in the United States, where, you know, because we live so much in our digital world, education needs to catch up. And we need to be teaching this earlier on in um, a, a, a kids' um, education and hopefully sort of make them so good at sort of filtering misinformation that when they get to college, we can then focus again more on the domains. Now the, the, the sort of the technology companies are doing a good job. I'm, I'm very critical in many ways of, the, uh, of some of the tech companies, and they've got us a lot into this mess. And I have a lot, and I can say a lot about this if we want to go into that um, space during the discussion. But I will give them a little bit of slack here, and they are doing some things. They are recognizing that their algorithms are promoting this, that the that it's too easy to create fake news. And I there I, I think there are some attempts, but there needs to be a lot more. Now, fortunately, there are fact-checking organizations out there, and I think they're underpaid, and I think they're over, they're, people value them, but we need more and more fact-checking organizations. Just to give you an example, Snopes receives more than 20 million visits per month. That puts it in one of the top websites on the internet, and probably in the top, Alexa top thousand. Guess how many employees they do that kind of important work on the internet with? 13, and that's, big. They used to only be four. We need to support our fact-checking organizations and keep them as neutral as possible. The reason why they can't make much money, because if they're given money by certain organizations, they will be known as biased. We have to watch out for them. But the most important thing, at least that Carl, I think, at least that we can do in our positions at a university and with our um, expertise is hopefully arm the consumer. Technology companies aren't going to solve it by themselves and they've gotten us into a mess. Laws are problematic in this space, so we just need to do a better job in society of arming the consumer. And that's where the class came about. We've been working on it for several years. You know, a lot of us th think that when we released the course in January of 2017 that it was a swipe at, uh, at uh, the, the new sort of Trump administration. That's not what it, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much misinformation outside of politics. In fact, we, we, there, we spend most of our time in the class not talking about political examples because they're too easy. Um, they come, and they're, and they're on both sides, left and right, 
It's, it's a bipartisan issue. And we try to be as nonpartisan as we can because we don't want to alienate anyone on the left and we don't want to alienate anyone on the right. But you can go to the course and we're going to continually adding um, content. Uh, we'll be teaching the course again, I'll starting again in a couple weeks. It fills, uh, fortunately for us, I mean, the, the students have been, uh, response has been amazing. It fills within a minute and typically has a long waiting list. It did sort of go viral, but that's not the part that excites us the most. We now, we've been contacted by more than 70 universities across the world to engage in this kind of uh, content of mixing media literacy, data reasoning, um, and critical reasoning. I'll say one thing about the pedagogy, just because I think it's important. It's the core contribution that Carl and I think is coming out of this. Because we're borrowing from philosophy and media studies and library studies. Our contribution, and we think, is at least the focus on the sort of data argument. I'm going to talk about that in just a sec. But the idea here is that we get intimidated by these black boxes. That's when someone you know, puts out some fancy statistic or fancy algorithm. And then we all sort of get scared and say, well, they must be smart. And I, or I don't know how that black box algorithm works. But our goal in this course is to take students that are freshmen in college and high school possibly and be able to call BS on literature uh, coming at the, the, the primary literature by focusing on the data input and the interpretations of that data. That's our core contribution. I don't have a lot of time to explain that. You can go to our lectures. I'm happy to talk about it before. But that's sort of related to this next slide where we break the world of BS into two forms. We think there's old school BS, and we think there's a new school BS. The old school BS is what students are great at, and a lot of the public's good at. We've had our whole life trained at looking at statements like this and sort of calling BS. Our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer-driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. I have no clue what that really means, but it means something to someone, and, and maybe it isn't BS, but it sure sounds a lot, and the students will put up their red flag on something like that. But when I put up something like this, well, short of statistical significance after Bonferroni correction, et cetera, et cetera, well, this just gets this stamp of authority. And it's here, this is my area of expertise and Carl's expertise, and this is the kind of arguments that we're seeing more and more outside of politics. Because we're, you know, we're we, you know, we talk a lot about politics, but I'm concerned about the misinformation in important places like science and at universities. And it's this data world that we live in, and that's the sort of classes I teach, data science and, and sort of this you know, big data uh, sort of revolution that's sort of taken over every aspect of society. It's here where I think there's a lot of BS too. And I want to put one definition up before we get to the discussions. I'm, I'm getting closer to wrapping up. This definition was built off of Harry Frankfurt, who was this philosopher at Yale, a real philosopher that had put a lot of thinking of, about BS. And one of the big take-homes from his book called On BS, it's a great holiday stuffer. Um, it says um, that he, basically he, the, he, he sees the liar as knowing where the truth is and just wants to move you away from the truth. Whereas a BSer just wants to, pers uh, this is our definition, um, this is where we sort of build on it. We think that the BS is different than the liar and that the liar doesn't, is sort of, doesn't really care what the truth is. They're simply trying to impress and persuade. And this definition has been evolving. But in this definition, we really think it's not just language and rhetoric. It's statistical figures today now. It's data graphics and other forms of pres presentation intended to impress. So let me explain with a couple slides really what I mean. When you put numbers up in society that look like this, they, they, seem, to, they, they seem to convey precision. They convey things like a, it's science-y, it's, it's replicable, it's objective. And that's why. 37% of public lectures include made-up statistics. <laughs> so watch out for those public lectures. But in all seriousness, we know this, especially from the work that's coming out of, that's always come for hundreds of years out of the humanities. And this is where Carl and I really want to bring the STEM and the humanities together because we don't think STEM's doing well enough at teaching our students how to question data in the same ways that they're taught to question other aspects of their world in which they communicate. And we know from those kinds of classes and those experiences that words are human constructs. They're subjective, they're fuzzy. Whereas numbers, they just come floating down directly from nature. They're just, they're, they're, they are um, those objective argument makers. But let me give you a specific example here. This is a quote from The Hill. You think the countries are giving us their best people? No, they give us their worst people. Now we could talk, you can put out a statement like this, just pull it out of thin air, and you can talk with students about this, and they can kind of get a sense of what this means. 
but it's not until you put numbers to those. Like Breitbart wrote the same, on the same story, wrote numbers, and this was actually a real number, it's not a fake number. 2,139 DACA recipients were convicted or accused of crime against Americans. Now that sounds scary. It's a big number, and it's what it was intended to do, but what do we tell our students? No matter what they hear, what do we need here? Numbers should always be presented with context, but they're not. And that's where you can manipulate really well if you want to manipulate. Now, we don't want students doing that, but if they wanted to, that's what they could do. <laughs> that you need these comparisons. So we lo I looked up this one. And this, not, this data is available. 2,139 was right, but that's one-third of 1% 1 of all DACA recipients have been convicted of a crime, whereas 8.6% of Americans have been convicted, at least, of a felony. So now we have something else to talk about. We can still talk about whether that 2,139 is something to be concerned about. But now we have some numbers in context. And I don't think at universities we're doing a good, good enough job teaching students to question numbers. This is what they're good at. If I give this to my students and I teach them how to take the Jacobian of the transformation, they do the mechanics beautifully. They can replicate a random forest algorithm or anything I throw at them, and they can do it better than me but they don't seem to question in the same ways and they get uncomfortable when we put numbers and have them do the same sorts of things that you were asked to do in your class when you, you talked about Macbeth and the symbolism of the birds and what that meant. It seems silly at the time maybe, but what it did is it, it sort of ingrained with you and trained sort of that value of critical reason, which is the one thing, if anything, we can give to students when they leave the university. And now let me give you a student or, or a number example. This is a real chart put out by Statista, which has no left or right leaning. They just sell data. And I saw this as caught our eye, Carl and I's eye. And the title of it was that carbon dioxide emissions from global fossil fuel combustion industrial processes from 1751 to 2016 in million metric tons, leveling off. What do we have to worry about? You guys can't see it because it's a little too far away. But the x-axis down here, the data's right, by the way. Again, they weren't, they had no sort of, all they're doing is trying to sell data. They're not trying to sell a story. They were just, they do, they sell thousands of these. And you can see at the bottom, the axis goes by 30-year increments. 1751 to 1781 to 1811, 1841. And it keeps going in 30 years increments until all of a sudden in 2010, it jumps to 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. <laughs> And as I tell students, this is one of many tricks of data presentation, that if you allow me to change the bins in a histogram or change the sort of spacing of the tick marks on the x-axis or the y-axis, I can tell any story I want. But if you require that I present it in a fair way with even ticks, let's take that exact data and let me show you what it looks like with even spacing of those years. That's what it looks like. Nothing different, same data, the only thing I did was space the ticks differently. And these examples live in our media, in our science journals, and I find them, I mean, in others, every single day. Just uh, a couple days ago, I saw this particular one. This is a little different than tick um, sort of manipulation. But they were looking at a story, which was an interesting story about the effect that maybe plastics are having on sperm count. And what they did is they looked at the, um, basically the production of uh, plastics on the right, and then they have this line with two points. Well, as far as I know, a line, you can make a line with any two points, wherever you put it, <laughs> and it tells any story. Now, it actually may be that plastics are affecting, affecting this drop in sperm count that we are finding, and that seems real across the world. But telling stories like this, we need to teach those producing these graphs and those reading these graphs that that's not the right way. Now, another thing I see all the time, and I, I could go on and on, Carl and I have many, many of examples, that if we wanted to look at who was sort of, in this case, paying what amount of taxes from different brackets or, or uh, sort of different demographics within the US, and this is based on real data, you see that the bottom 50% of US citizens only pay 2.8%. And you have this tiny little, you know, up at the top of the pyramid, and then you see top 1% pays 39.5% of the taxes. But I'll let you sort of look at that for a second and see what it violates. It violates something that Carl and I call the principle of proportional ink. If you present data, it needs to be proportional to the number of pixels you throw on the screen. 
That's a simple idea of saying that in this case, if you it, just by basically adding up the surface area, because that's what we're seeing, should be proportional, right, to the number that you're actually reporting on. That doesn't the case in many of these graphics. Many of these, I mean, I would say even, well, I won't claim that more than not, but we'll just say a lot. Compared to the bottom 10%, the top percent are given 125 times as many pixels per percentage point. If you then do it by volume, it gets much worse. 2,600 times as much implied by volume per percentage point. Now, if someone sees that, they'll notice that and they'll say, well, that's silly. That's not a fair presentation. But when you see these in tweets and that's all you see, it may change your perception. Now, if you are one that sort of tracks climate change issues, you may have seen the only graphic you'll ever need to see uh, tweeted out by the National Review. And this got tweeted, you know, tons and, or retweeted and shared many times. And what you have is the global temperatures, and they didn't lie on the data. The data's real. But what they do, they zoomed in. They basically actually went down to negative. Uh, looks like negative Fahrenheit all the way up to 110. This is the average temperature of the Earth over this time period. And again, what do we have to worry about? You zoomed out far enough, it's a flat line. <laughs> but as um, Philip Bump showed, uh, if you zoom in on that, Fairly, and there's times when you shouldn't zoom in. I can talk about that, I don't have time, but that's, there's ways to manipulate with zooming in too much. But here, it's a fair, because he's using a line graph. You see in the last half century, we see a two degree increase, which then we can debate, but we shouldn't sort of be manipulative with the way we present data. But my, the most fun I have with students is coming up with what are called reductio ad absurdum or responses, um, refutations of this data, and what Bloomberg did with that graphic said this. They said, okay, if you buy that argument, then I'll put time on the x-axis and I'll put time on the y-axis, same things, zoom out far enough and prove to you that time doesn't march forward. Because <laughs> that should be a diagonal, not a straight line. But there's other ways, of course, and many, 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 many other ways with these debates around gun deaths um, in the U.S., it's, you know, it's, it's really depressing. You find that, um, you know, this Florida, the Florida enacted this controversial stand your ground law, and people have wanted to see what kind of effect it's had. And again, we can debate whether that's good or not. But what you see here is in 2005 it was enacted, and this was presented, and this is real data. And you see this drop in this black line. But what's wrong with this graphic? It's flipped. It was breaking conventions from the last 2,000 years on how we present data. And so here, what you're seeing is actually an increase and not a decrease, but that's how it was produced and that's how it landed in Twitter. Now, this particular author, and some make mistakes. This turns out this author was actually trying to make it sort of graphically pretty by having it look like blood dripping down and made a mistake. So honest mistakes do happen, but also manipulations happen as well. I'm gonna skip this example because I wanna give enough time for um, the discussion. So I just want to, um, sort of end with a couple examples. I talk about old school BS and new school BS. Let me just mention two other things that scare me. There's old school tech and new school tech, and they both have enormous impact. In the olden days, that's even just like 10 years ago, you would take an image like this. This is, a, this is Michael Bennett dancing in a, after a, a celebration with Seattle Seahawks in the locker room after a game one. That soon, with some photoshopping technique, turned out to be burning a flag. This spread like wildfire until those that created the image finally admitted that it was fake. Now, photoshopping you can, you can take away, but the problem is, and people can debate, again, whether that's right or wrong, but sending this kind of misinformation doesn't help the discussion. And this kind of stuff can be identified somewhat, but it still hits that emotional center of our brains and this, like many of these memes, are so imagery. That's old school tech. It's still here, and it is concerned. That stuff, it almost is worse than graphs. But it's another kind of tech that I'm worried about. My seven-year-old is into space right now. So we go, we go to the YouTube International Space Station. There's a live feed of space from the International Space Station. This is really cool. And as we were watching it, and I was talking to him about what the space station is doing and why it was moving so fast, I was looking at the recommendations on the side of the video of other videos I should be reading. I started seeing that uh, YouTube thought I should be learning about how the Earth is actually flat, that uh, demonstrates the absurd, the 10 strange things you didn't know about Earth, etc. So I went into incognito mode. That's the mode that doesn't know much about me. 
And I got even worse, more extreme conspiracy-laden videos. So our rec these recommendations have realized that conspiracy divisive material and far extreme video, video is stuff that people watch and it's delivering it to us more than it is the true stuff. That should be concerning. The other thing that's concerning is that our search engines gobble up all crazy stories and, doesn't, and we don't have time to refute everything. So Carl and I thought, what is the craziest question we could get Google so that it won't pull up anything? Zero results. So we put up, we said, do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? I, that sounds preposterous. I hope no one thinks that's a real thing. And lo and behold, what do we find? There are websites that claim there's a link between shaken baby syndrome and vaccines. And the medical community doesn't have time or the resources to refute all these crazy ideas. But these search engines create this veneer of truth. Now let me share you the scariest tech that's coming if you haven't seen it already. The scariest tech comes out of my university, which I'm, I don't know how proud, I, actually I'm not proud of it. This technology is Photoshopping of videos and audio. They now have the ability to take any leader, any person from a video, say, create their own what they want that person to say, superimpose it on their face, and you can hear it, audio is more, is more impressive, the video still has some issues, and you can have anyone say what they want. So Photoshopping was something we were fearing, I'm fearing even more the Photoshopping of voice, and that, that's already, it's out there. And if you've been watching like Jordan Peele and some of these others that have tried to bring that to the public's attention, watch some of those videos. That's scary. And so on that sort of crazy, um, scary note um, and sort of end of days sort of note, I want to end here by saying again with some a little bit of optimism that we've been through this before. In the 1970s and, and many times before that, we had air that looked like this. And somehow we came together and we were able to clean up our polluted environments. But we now, in that other world we live in now, the digital world in which we now spend just as much, if not more, of our time, it's polluted. And we need to all come together, all, you know, all um, areas of society, not just educators, librarians, journalists, politicians, business leaders, we all need to come together because we had one of my, when I was a kid, one of my favorite of public service announcements was Smokey the Bear, and I don't know if they have this, um, I don't know if he, he made it up to Canada, but, um, but what he was saying was, it's only you, and that ends me with one of my favorite of Neil Postman's quote, and that is that at any given time, the chief source of BS with which we have to contend is ourself. So with that, I'll end and turn it over to the commentators. Thank you, Jamin. That was terrific. Uh, I'd like to, to begin our discussion. I just want to invite uh, two respondents to, to the stage. The first is going to be uh, Lasha Kretzel, who is a digital radio reporter with News 1130, based here in Vancouver. Her work uses digital and social media in conjunction with traditional radio formats to bring accurate breaking news to audiences. However, it can sometimes bring her in contact with dubious and fake news sources. Uh, her personal experiences with fake news were recently featured in several outlets, including The Guardian, after altered versions of her photographs were circulated online. So please welcome on stage, Lasha. Our second respondent will be my colleague here in the Faculty of Communication, Arts, and Technology, Dr. Stuart Points. Stuart is an associate dean in the faculty and associate professor in the School of Communications. Uh, Stuart's research addresses children's media cultures, theories of public life, and urban youth media production. He currently serves as the president of the Association for Research and Cultures of Young People and as the director of the Media Democracy Project. Welcome, Stuart. So, uh, Lasha, we can begin with you then. Is on? Yeah, we're good? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I don't think I've ever used one of those shocking headlines, thankfully. <laughs> I was very happy. I was going down the list and thinking, have I ever? Oh, God, no, please. Um, thankfully, I have not. But I have seen them uh, on Twitter when we don't actually put the headlines of an ad. We just say, you know, there's something to try to get the reader to actually get there. And while I don't personally know the amount of clicks that my stories get, I do know that we do track them. And we are looking constantly about what people are reading on our websites, what's getting the most hits, are we reflecting that, are we actually doing what the, our audience actually wants to see. And that's good and bad, we want to provide them with information that they find valuable, but at what, at what point do we say we actually need to also 
bring stuff to you that you probably didn't know about. So uh, for me, for those of you who don't know, as I just mentioned, I work for News 1130. And um, recently I had an experience where I had a photo of mine that was uh, doctored and spread online. It was for a couple of years. I didn't know about it, but it, I didn't really touch on it until uh, I had the uh, leader of the uh, UK and, or uh, Britain's Independence Party, Nigel Farage, actually retweeted it. And uh, at that point, I said, oh, dear, this is somebody of prominence. I should probably actually say something because he's not just your average troll. Uh, so that's, that's one of the ways that, that, that we as reporters can encounter fake news is when somebody takes something that we have created and, and changes it, warps it, or uses the information therein. Uh, but there's lots of other different ways. For example, uh, think tanks are people that we come in regular contact with. They provide us with press releases, information that they, they want to uh, have us report on and bring to the public, whether that be studies that they've done, polls, things like that. And the first thought that always goes through our heads is, okay, what's, what's your angle? Are you right-leaning, left-leaning? What's your agenda? And that is really important to understand when bringing forward this, these, these think tanks and their information because obviously they can present us something that has that, that bias, has that, that data that they have manipulated in some way, uh, perhaps not maliciously or maybe not even in, in, intending, but uh, it can happen and if we're not careful we can fall prey to that trap and we're just sort of spreading their information without thinking about it. Uh, obviously any sources that we come in contact uh, with, whether that's scientists, politicians, uh, everyday people, they can always present us with false information and it's our job to, to, to be that barrier between the public and these individuals and that can often be a big challenge when we have so much information coming at us now. Uh, obviously, for us, a lot of people just hurl the word fake news at us like an insult now, as opposed to what it actually refers to. Uh, they take it more to mean news that I disagree with, as opposed to news that is legitimately not real. And that can be a big deal for us when we're trying to deal with that. Um, part of it is, is press releases, as you mentioned, whether that's science or politicians, is that when you're sending out a press release, you're really distilling down a, a, what otherwise could be a very complex story and a very nuanced story into these, these clickbaity headlines so journalists click open on your email. And we realize this. When you send us an email that has all caps, I'm already a little incredulous to open it because <laughs> I know that there's probably something that you're, you are trying to sell me. Um, and so it's our job to try and parse through that. But that can be really difficult because obviously um, for us as reporters and as you just mentioned in this digital age there is so much information coming at us at, at a ridiculous amount of speeds. My, my newsroom for example we are running 24-7 we don't stop there's always somebody in our newsroom always somebody reading the news always somebody trying to fact check that news <laughs> and report it and our, our appetites now are so, so hungry for this information and we want it now, we want it fast, we want it accurate. And sometimes that is, those two don't work hand in hand where we want to get the information out there quickly, but if we're not given the time to properly read a study, and I've seen this lots, especially with science journalism, is we, we don't read the study completely or we don't even read necessarily the parts that matter and we go for the clickbaity headline that is given to us in a press release instead because it's quick and it's easy and it's not right, but we do it. Um, so that's why I, I really want to stress the idea, and of course this is just me in my own industry, but please support your media. Please pay for it because I need to eat <laughs> um, and I need to be able to have the time to actually thoroughly go through these stories as opposed to us having to generate story, 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 story and feeling more like, a, like just a story mill as opposed to actually uh, creating content that has some meaningful uh, research and time behind it that I was actually able to spend the time as opposed to being told I need to have five stories in a day. Um, but us as reporters, we, we do falter, we do make mistakes. I would like to think that, at least I can only speak for myself, I don't do it maliciously. And I don't try to have an, uh, you know, I try to be objective in my work, but obviously all of us are still human, just like you. We have our own personal biases. We have our own beliefs 
And we can't always disassociate from that, whether that be, like I mentioned, our biases, our beliefs, our, our own education alone, and our own interests. And that's why I do encourage people, regardless of their fields, to think about actually reporting. Uh, freelance is a great way to get work, and regardless of the field that you're in, you can contribute. Most of us, I didn't get into journalism because I'm good at math. So that, that is something that I struggle with when I come in contact with a lot of numbers and a lot of statistics is I have to really parse through that. I would love to see more people in business. I would love to see the people um, that, that, that went to school for math or, or an area that I'm not good at. I'd love to see you looking at your own data, looking at your own fields and seeing where is something, some information that I need to bring to people and, and because I understand what I'm looking at, because the journalist who's writing out of that press release might not. So I really encourage people, I took science news, but that doesn't mean that I am an expert. I'm not a biologist, I'm not a physicist, so I might miss things, but I highly encourage you, regardless of your field, think about writing in that area. And it's a great way to just get that, that proper information out and, and with, with good, in, yeah, so. Um, overall, I guess that, like you had mentioned, like. None of this is excuses for us. When we do make mistakes, we want, I want to be called out on it. I do. I hope in a polite way, because I'm not trying to, to you know, mess with you. I'm not trying to mislead people. Um, but I think that, that that is a good way to just try and, I don't know, make the public discourse better. So I guess I'll end it with that. That's probably more than five minutes. Perfect. Thank you. <gasps> good. I'm a reporter. I like to talk. <laughs> Let's do it, your reaction. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, first of all, uh, Jeff and I want to thank you. It was a very provocative and interesting and animated talk, which I think is what we need to engage with this. Um, I want to just comment very quickly on something uh, that was said in the uh, last response, which was, I remember a few years back, uh, a friend came from University of Massachusetts Amherst and talked about how to support um, media and news media. And he had a really good little rule of thumb. Whatever you spend on mainstream media, try to spend an equal amount on alternative media and local media. Keep that little, game, that little calculation in mind because it allows for the, the feathering in the, of our world with ideas and voices that uh, often disappear from view. So just keep that little calculation in mind. I think it encourages people to actually support the media that um, contests uh, certain versions of uh, uh, fake news and truth in our world. Um, I wanted to offer a slightly different response to the talk, which is um, I, I want to talk about um, what we're doing when we are contesting fake, fake news and what the aims of these things are. And I want to put this out as a, as a proposal. I think that it's important to recognize that part of the conditions that we live in that shape uh, the appeal and the popularity and the attraction of so-called fake news, the very words fake news, is our isolation from each other our deep sense of fragmentation and separation that are part of our lives today. I think we see this and we hear about this in cities like Vancouver all the time. We know that people are living alone more than ever before. We know that um, there are many ways in which we are not seeing or hearing each other, and particularly those who are not like us, who are different from us. And I think that one of the things, obviously, that Jevin has pointed to about social media as one element of this condition is that it, it creates conditions which bring, the, bring us together with those who are like us or who share our ideas. And in this way, we end up reproducing and creating a very fragmented world. In that fragmented world, it becomes much easier to hear what we think we already know. And it becomes harder to hear things that challenge us and contest us. Another piece of the context that we live in today that's fundamentally important that Jevin pointed to is the way in which um, uh, Jevons used the language of bullshit. I would say more broadly, the language of marketing and marketing speak and spiel is so uh, integrated into our lives that the, the call to make things loud and a, spe and a spectacle is, is deeply hard to avoid, as you pointed out. And so this really um, creates a situation where fake news or the difficulty of finding more robust and substantive information to inform our lives. Sure. To find more robust and substantive information to inform our lives is very difficult today, is really hard. I think that um, one response to that situation is what Jevin pointed to as media literacy. And I, uh, and, and 
have much more to say about this. In Canada, there are very strong traditions of media literacy, and particularly in our schools, there's really um, uh, strong efforts to build media literacy and digital literacy into curricula. This is a positive kind of development. At the same time, I think there's a larger question that we have to ask ourselves, which is, what are we aiming to do when we challenge fake news? Where are we going with this? What is our goal? And I think one of our knee-jerk reactions to that question is to turn to the idea of truth, that what we're trying to do is preserve and hold to truth. And I want to suggest that we pull back from that. It's not that rigor, the ability to read false statistics, the ability to read the misuse of science, the critically analyze the misuse of science is an important, profoundly important kinds of work that we need to inform our students with. But I also raise the wonder if what we're aiming towards is to preserve truth or is actually to preserve community. And I want to make the argument that what we're trying to do when we call fake news into question is not to raise the status of truth. It matters. And rigorous argument matters. But what matters more than that, I would argue, is our ability to question fake news in order to build mutuality and connection with others. To question fake news in order to find ways to build common ground with others, people who are different than us. Because the thing we face most now, and that fake news, I would argue, is used, used most powerfully to do, is to separate us from each other to allow the loudest voices to stand forth and to take the space that the rest of us should be sharing as part of the commons and the common ground that we have. And I think what we do when we call into question fake news and, and question it with our students is we must help them and ourselves to do that in a way that doesn't alienate others, but brings us together into a dialogue and a collective form. I want to end with this point. Jevin, um, ended his talk by pointing to earlier historical moments where societies and communities have faced um, deep problems of uh, industrial alienation, the uh, uh, pollution of cities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the misrepresentation of those experiences. And what's changed those situations is the rallying and the calling together of communities. It's the mobilization of people. That has, been, that has allowed us to change the, um, the, the misrepresentations, the lies that are part of our world. And so in this sense, I want to say the goal of challenging fake truth is not the preservation of truth, it's the preservation of our collective world and our society that we care about and are involved in together. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I'm going to uh, start by taking by uh, asking a question myself. But while we do that, start thinking about your questions. And we're going to have a couple people running around with some mics. So just sort of put up your hand and identify yourselves if you would like to ask a question to uh, to to any of our uh, any of our speakers. Um, and and we'll have someone sort of come around and bring you a mic. Uh, let me start by just asking this question, probably to you, Jevin, but also to the others. Um, one of the things that we've you know, that the courses that, the course that we're doing with this class, but also in the other classes that I've done, the work that I do, for example, around open access and trying to get more researchers to share their research available to the public, is this idea that the ideas and the thoughts that we all have, we should be putting out there into the public sphere. We, if we believe in the things that we think, we believe the things that we write and that we, that, that our understanding of the world, that we should be putting that out there for others to see and that staying silent is in some ways allowing an environment where bullshit is able to perpetuate. But I, I want to ask you if, you if you believe that doing that is enough to try to combat the sea of bullshit that we are swimming in. Let's see, can you, okay. So unfortunately, no, I don't think it's enough. I, I, think, I, I do think this movement, uh, and I'm a huge um, advocate of open access in science and actually been following Juan Paulo's work um, and, and the efforts that he's been putting in this space. And actually, great news around this space too, if you don't follow this, is that the European Union is now sort of requiring this of the, this, the science that they support. Um, but putting it out there, it's a great first step. But I think we, we still, because of the sort of this overload of information, because of how difficult it is to, 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 disin, 
tangle of complicated statistics and graphs and, and all information that we uh, we're sort of information processing machines now and we need we we just they're, they're just we can all use more help in this space so just by putting it out is not enough um, I think that we need to really put a lot of effort if not more into continually teaching our next generation and the current generation to be able to um, you know disentangle arguments and to help that producer because most most of the time I think those that are putting that information out um, whether it's a scientist or it's um, sort of of a freelance reporter, I think they have good intentions. I'm an optimist in this world, and I think a lot of times that information, um, if, it, if it is misinformation or there's problems with it, it's likely honest mistakes. So we need the collective, and it doesn't do any good to house that data um, to, uh, sort of in a box or behind a university paywall. I think it's super important if we want to solve some of society's biggest and most challenging problems that we all benefit when research that comes out of Simon Fraser University or University of Washington is made available to all aspects of the world, including the developing world. But we need to go into those areas and also teach them how to be good consumers of that data. OK, so we've got a couple questions. Can let's take a question over here on this side. Um, thank you very much. Can you help us understand the threat that the Freedom of Information Act is, uh, is under? That's for, for us who are on the outside. And for whistleblowers who are on the inside who do speak are now going to jail. And uh, just a, a, a tiny anecdote is uh, the Ontario government now has their own fake news network called Ontario News Now. <laughs> and you have staffers who are applauding to drown out the questions of the reporters. Um, so where's the trend or the trajectory of all of this? So I want my colleagues to be able to speak too because I've been speaking a lot. But I'll just say one, one quick thing. Those that kind of came up with this idea and there's some fun history around this idea, um, you know, this Freedom of Information Act, I think they're, they're, they, they're, they're, there's, there's this real wisdom that's sort of percolated through these generations. There's a reason why we want to have that and it is being attacked right now. And it's not just being attacked in Canada or the United States. It's actually, I mean, I, I don't, this is sort of an, maybe an overstepping, but when I've been to these international conferences where I then stand up and talk about the problems in the US, and then someone like you, someone from Ukraine or, or journalists from these other countries where it's a real attack, they, I think we should be turning to them and, sh and asking them, what, you know, how did it get that far? What are the repercussions? I think at this point, we should be looking to those that are, you know, far advanced. On the, on the bad side uh, in this um, sort of onslaught on the freedom of information. So I think we should we'd be thinking about conversations with them. Um, I think one, one on that to look at is Poland at this point, because it's kind of going that way right now, where we, we see, like you sort of mentioned, those laws about fake news, you're, you're concerned that's what they're kind of moving towards, is media they don't like is deemed not allowed. Um, when it comes to things like like the whistleblowers, and, and I mean, obviously for, for us reporters, that's an invaluable source. So uh, I feel sort of biased in my opinion of there, there needs to be more protections for those individuals. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think about when it, when, I mean, when it comes to the discussions like that and with, when we have governments like that uh, in power, I, I'm... I mean, it's not the first time, first and foremost, that something like this, like you mentioned with the Ontario News Network, I mean, we've had elections where we've had ads that look like uh, media reports before on television run, and, and that, that idea about using the, the facade or the veneer of we're a legitimate media source to spread that information is not new. Uh, some of our advertisements, even, on our station, we don't like, because they start off with breaking news, and I'm like, it's not, it's an ad. Don't say it's news. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, just when we're looking at that, like you mentioned, it's, it's keeping that idea in the public eye. It's having, I think part of it is those individuals that want to come forward. It's having those discussions with the reporters. I know they're putting themselves in a precarious position, um, and we thank them for that, and we know that it's not an easy position to put yourself in. Um, but we need, if, if you're feeling stifled in that way, we need to know about it. And, and just having that dialogue with people. I mean, I, I know that a lot of individuals are scared to talk to the media. They are concerned that we're going to take their words and warp it. Um, and sometimes that does happen. I, I would hope personally that I don't do that. It does, I'm sorry, 
uh, for all the media that, and anybody else who has felt slighted by what they've said to a, an outlet. Um, but I think that unless we have that dialogue with people, we're not going to know what's going on with your situation. We're not going to understand the, the plight that you're going through. So I think that having, having that open discussion with individuals who want to come forward with that information, say, look, I have something I want to talk to you about, but here's the part that scares me is that I won't be able to. Um, and then we can start to have that, that pointing reporters towards the information that, that, they, that can help ameliorate the situation. Uh, I just want to add to the points that have been made so far that I think um, the freedom of information issue in Canada is, um, has been really uh, pressing over the last decade, hasn't it really? And I, I think we really saw during the last federal government a really drawn out and strained set of antagonisms around requests for information on the part of the media that was a, a regular and ongoing process. And it brings to mind for me the question that um, may stand around our conversation, which is what's the role of regulation in this? The role of, um, and by regulation I mean, what are the, role, what are the roles of state and citizen-oriented spaces that um, are enabled to respond to the Ontario News Network, for instance, as well as challenges to request for um, freedom of information that are um, uh, allow those um, uh, struggles, which often happen um, off stage in the dark and are very hard to follow, to come into view into a forum with people who have invested relations in trying to ensure there's open access to governments, open access and an opportunity to uh, force uh, politicians and others with power to speak and defend the decisions that they're making rather than to hide behind efforts to um, undermine freedom of information. So I suspect the question of regulation is going to come into our conversation throughout this evening, but this is one place where I think um, the role of bodies like, and I don't want to defend the CRTC because I think there's many reasons for it to change, but I think there are um, reasons to uh, think more, um, uh, uh, more, more um, uh, strategically uh, about the role of regulation in dealing with a number of issues around how uh, messages are able to circulate in very simple and misleading ways now. Because I want to wrap it to open access, I'll say it real quick. I want to give you a tangible example at my university. So we're a public university. Everything that I write, my email, everything is publicly available if you do a FOIA request. So if you do a freedom of information action request. But there's one piece of information you can't get from the university. There's a few others, but here's one. You can't know, as a taxpayer of our university, if you're a taxpayer, how much our university libraries pay for publishers. And that's quite clever of the publishers. Um, they don't allow you to talk. Librarians can't talk to other librarians, or they'll, they'll be in big trouble. They signed these NDAs. So a colleague of mine, and, and I've been a part of it, but he's been the one driving at UCSB. He's a university in California. Did a FOIA request of these contracts. And I won't give you the full story because it's a great story. But he was able to do a FOIA request. He did get sued by the publishers from Elsevier that came flying over from Netherlands and, and decided to sue him and others that were trying to get this contracts. Well, what you found was a very uh, price discrimination, as you'd expect, across these public universities. And that's information that should be available to the public. And so that's, an, that's a specific example of how it can be successful. But now that's being pulled back, again, of course, Publishers don't like that information out. So again, we need these tangible examples so that the rest of the public can see why it's useful. OK, great. Can we have, do we have another question? Maybe somebody from one of the students in the class at the front here? Or anybody at? Here we go. <laughs> Hopefully this will be a quick question, but um, you had mentioned that one of the things, Jevin, that is getting really scary is Photoshop. And this is for anybody who wants to answer, but I'm just wondering what you know, the best way is to combat that, especially with students who are constantly online and seeing all these things and, and just making sure that they're not falling into these fake news traps when it comes to Photoshop and that kind of thing. I'll just say one quick thing. It isn't anything technical. By the way, there are technical responses to the Photoshopping and even of this Photoshopping of voice. But the best thing students can do is if it sounds too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. And that principle is useful in those kinds of circumstances. I'd say if you know it's yours, speak up, because that's what I had to do <laughs> from personal experience. It, it's if you know that it's fake, it, it, especially if it's yours, at least there's that credibility behind it. So that's what happened with me, and that's my best advice right now. You know what? I just want to say um, that 
The technical answer, the technical response that Jevon points to is one route. I actually think working with students to do close examination of images. We live with images at such an easy and naturalized level now that we assume we know how to read them and work with them. And in fact, we often don't. We take them as um, taken for granted. And I think that many images actually, as you begin to break down how they're constructed and how the lines and the texture and the lighting, you start to see um, imperfections that begin to reveal themselves. Not in every case, but it's really a call to take seriously the idea to read and to look at images in a kind of deep way at a time when things just roll by, our, roll by us and we feel ourselves to be expert because we have to be. Okay. Question from Andrew. See up, down here at the front. Okay, let's take one there and we'll come back. Mm. Hey, uh, Jevin, uh, first of all, thanks so much for your, uh, your talk. Um, you mentioned that Russia, for one, is uh, you kind of pointed out that it's being very engaged in the mis misinformation campaigns and whatnot, but also made reference as well to the U.S. or to other actors um, engaging in it. I'm wondering, the negative side's being quite obvious. Uh, there's the there's the appeal of um, politicians, governments engaging in these kinds of misinformation campaigns to further national aims. You see Russia having been very effective at that. Um, in the, the previous election, so to what extent is uh, can can governments or should governments say, well, we're going to we're going to preserve our own electorate, we're going to preserve our own people, at the same time, um, uh, rather reaping or not reaping the rewards of engaging in the same kind of tactics when it comes to those outside their uh, uh, their political demands. Yeah, I think you're making a really good point here, and I think the point that's being made is that um, by creating sort of an attack dog or an enemy, or you create this um, sort of, you know, you create Rocky movies with Russia against the U.S., and you have these kinds of things there. It, it sort of can further agendas when, you know, in fact, I mean, you know, there are plenty of examples where the U.S. is um, sort of, has, you know, they certainly have engaged in these disinformation campaigns with certain elections, especially in Central America and, and other places. And I don't think, you know, from a, a world citizen standpoint, that's not the right strategy. And the national agendas can sort of break those sorts of things down. So in a perfect world, I would say, you know, we wouldn't have those kinds of borders because, you know, I don't even have to get into the reasons why. But I but I, I guess I'll just sort of end on the point that you're making that I think students and we should have these kinds of discussions about whether that's good or whether that's not. And having those discussions, maybe we can articulate better what it, you know, what that's actually doing to our overall missions if we're engaging that behavior. I just want to say to Jevin's last point, I mean, national borders are deeply porous. The idea of a, a nation being able to pursue this in a way that, uh, this is about the idea of the real politic logic of it. It seems in this particular historical moment to be an impossible aim that, that is, is only um, imaginable if one can fathom some kind of deeply uh, uh, narrow view of the nation that doesn't exist for those of us in this room for that matter, never mind people living in their everyday lives. So there seems to be a, a, a real implicit contradiction in, in that idea of a, a real politic policy around it. I put aside Trump in the way in which that's being pursued now. Okay. President Petter had a question at the front. Thank you. I just wondered if uh, Jevin and the panel would like to comment on the phenomenon of the purveyors of fake news increasingly using the language of fake news, appropriating the language of fake news to discredit real news, and what to do about it. Just two days ago, we had a report from the governor of Puerto Rico estimating the death toll from the hurricane there at close to 3,000. The response from the President of the United States was this was politically motivated fake news. So the discourse of fake news, which has been created to respond to some of the very serious challenges you've mentioned, is itself being appropriated in order to discredit news that is not fake and to advance news that is. That's right, and that's the fear. That's why having laws against it can, can be that's something that I, I, I fear. I would say, you know, one of the solutions I've heard, at least amongst those that have thought about this pretty deeply, is to stop using the term, at least in, in circles where we're trying to have productive dialogue, is to move away, or at least, you know, note that the, the term is loaded and here's how it's being used and here's how it's being misused. At least start conversations with it. So, so I, think it's a, a really, um, I think it's a really important point. I'll also say, I'll, I'll point to some specific research that's really interesting around um, sort of 
fake news um, in general. So if you go to these, uh, a colleague of mine, Kate Starberg at the University of Washington, has been tracking these conspiracy communities online. And one of the things that she has found, uh, which is super interesting, um, is that when she's tracking individual users in, let's say, um, you know, an anti-vaccination uh, community that's sort of festering this idea that vaccinations um, sort of are leading to autism, et cetera, they find those same users end up being in other, con they start easily moving to other conspiracy. It's sort of like a gateway drug in some ways. They're now over in the flat earthers, and this this is this is a this is a sort of a, a real concern. And um, by doing that, you sort of you, you sort of become primed by it too. So by using this term fake news, by sort of just throwing it out, you know, just you know loosely, then it becomes you know it, it becomes a a real problem. And I think you know again designating the sort of loadedness of that might be a way of sort of addressing and sort of responding to the, sort of that priming, the psychological priming that it has on people. Um, but I'll let my colleagues say more. Um, sort of like you mentioned, we get that a lot in media where we get told our stories are fake news when really it's, they're not. They're just means they disagree. Um, I think, well, obviously one way is, is asking for that proof is, is that the, I mean, if somebody's going to call fake news on something, I would hope that they would have the, the data, the correct data. It's not just enough to call something Fake news? Can you can you provide that that proof otherwise? Because obviously, I mean, if it, like you mentioned, we're we're even in science stories now, they're trying to use data to manipulate us to believe that it's real. So I think that that that's part of it is us asking. But also, as media, we most most of most of us see as our role as as these object uh, or uh, disinterested observers. Um, when, when in, and, and that's our role to just say he said this as opposed to us actually maybe critically analyzing what somebody is saying and, and being the ones to call BS on, on somebody when they're saying th these things. Not just reporting he said this, she said this, but actually saying, and that's not right and that's not correct. Uh, so I think that that also plays heavily on us to actually be a bit more, um, that's not necessarily, I guess, bias, but, but not just leaving it to the reader to, to necessarily know whether that is right or wrong, maybe it's time to actually be pointing that out. So I want to take one more question, then we can continue the conversation over. Uh, we're going to have a reception outside where the conversation can continue. You'll be able to engage with our speakers and with uh, and with each other. Uh, there was one from the back over there. I wanted to, I always the people at the back always want to. They always get the short stick on the question front. So I want to give one to all the way at the back, and then uh, and then we'll continue. And please, uh, we'll, you'll be able to continue the conversation, come up and continue the, the uh, asking questions to the speakers after we after we finish. So you got the last question. Thank you for the question from the back. Um, a question about maybe focused on tech, but let's use Facebook as the example. Um, is the is the platform to blame, or to your last quote, are the people on it to blame? And and I take that because I was watching those three tech executives get on the firing line, and and I was thinking to myself, well, are they really responsible for everything um, that's there? And a corollary to that, and maybe a bit fatalistic, is um, a lot of that discussion was we're going to hire a bunch of people and fix it. And today I read an article that Facebook is going to start um, filtering photo and video for fake news. And do we have the capacity to do that or is it just kind of an uphill battle? Um, and, and, and like I said, a little bit fatalistic, but two sort of questions. Can I just? I, I, I want to say a really, your first point, are the platforms to blame? I, I don't know that there's one answer to that. I would say this though, and I think many of us in the room know that platforms are organized around algorithms of homology, of sameness. And I think that if platforms were, um, uh, ex would experiment and move uh, to organize their algorithms less around sameness and uh, common ground and more around difference, that would produce a very different information universe that we all inhabit. And that would, pre that would present us with things we have to think through differently. One of Jevon's major points was thinking matters. Thinking is hard and it matters and we have to learn how to do it better. And one of the ways we're provoked by that is when we're not sure what we're seeing. When something is, is unknown to us and is surprising. And if platforms moved in that direction, it would certainly open up a very different uh, media space than the one we're very, very familiar with now. 
Um, I don't think it's necessarily one or the other. I, I think that it's often a combination of, of users and, and platforms, but because uh, I think to, to blame just a platform solely would be sort of saying that are those who brought us the internet to blame for everything that's on it. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that w when we're looking at that, it's also, well, what, what was the intent of their platforms? What, what was their mantra? What, what, what are they saying? I mean, if, if you have something like Google with a mantra of do no harm or you know, do no evil, is that being followed through on in some fashion? Uh, and holding people to, to account, especially if they live in a society that values itself on certain aspects. Um, as to the people, uh, obviously it's, it, it is up to us to, to understand that what we are putting out there is genuine, to actually read stuff, like you had the Facebook thing up there that most of us don't actually click the article. Uh, we get that all the time with our comment section. So many people don't read the article. And then they ask questions, and we're like, it's, it's literally the first line. <laughs> the other half of us don't yeah. read the comments. So. No, that too. <laughs> that too. Thank God, sometimes you don't. Um, but I have to. Um, and uh, I think that, that similar to when I saw people retweeting that image of mine that I knew was fake and them making comments, things like, oh, this is disgusting or, oh, this is horrible. I'm thinking, did you not realize this is tr not true? Are they putting in that time? Please put in the time to make sure that what you're distributing is authentic. Please don't just hit share, like, pass along, and uh, actually looking at what we are, are, are distributing. And I think that that, that will play a, a key role, in, 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 um, especially if you agree with it. If you disagree with it, it's a lot harder because you actually want to read and maybe find out, well, what's the flaw in this article? But if you agree with something, look even harder at it because that's where I think you're going to find uh, that, you're, that you, might be, you might see something wrong or that we're actually going to challenge ourselves and our beliefs. So I'll just say it is a very complicated answer, but I'll say one thing about the platforms. They have one important objective, and the objective that they're trying to optimize is the amount of time and attention they can keep you on that platform. So YouTube or Facebook, and those algorithms are even out of the human's control now. We actually do a, a research now and we sort of, we look at the effects of all these, you know, millions and millions of A-B experiments where they're seeing what is it that keeps you on the platform? What click, what color, what way of orienting the text and the image and the way we display it? And because of that objective, it moves away from sort of greater um, sort of, uh, sort of, um, production for society. I mean, this is, this is not necessarily what we want for society. It's great, you know, you know feed, feed a machine a, a set of data and you give it an objective, it will, it will do a good job of, of getting at that. And right now, that objective of keeping us on the platform is not good for society. And what it does, and, and again, it's not that Facebook is totally at to, uh, to blame, but what, what the sort of current environment does um, is create these echo chambers, as many have probably heard, and the public dialogue that we need gets hidden in a place that you don't even know. So you can filter by that exact demographic, by that exact like. You can, you can do this, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm kind of a skeptic of some of these psychometric sort of, um, uh, sort of measurements, but, but to some degree, it's not that that you can do. It's, it's just finding that exact demographic you want. You can send a message, and no one else in the rest of the world can even know that it's happening. Whereas in the old form of media, at least that one you know, news channel you might watch, at least everyone sees it, and if they say something stupid, you can rebut it. But you can't rebut it anymore if it's hidden in this dark corner of the internet. And when you start, and then the algorithms see that and they feed it. And that's, it's these kinds of issues. It's that objective function. I'd like to experiment, as others have said, with different objective functions and maybe it'll be a better platform for the rest of society. And that's a great note to end on. because <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanna I want to thank uh, our speaker, our respondents, and everyone that has helped to make uh, this happen. This is, would not be possible without the support of too many units and too many people for me to mention, especially this late in the game. Uh, most of you all thank all of you for coming and engaging in this conversation. I hope you continue to engage in the conversation as the rest of the colloquium continues. SFU.ca slash making knowledge public. You can find the rest of the talks in the series as well as the syllabus to the course if you want to follow along with us there. I hope you stay to join us for a reception where we can continue the conversation. There's a lot of hands that were still up that I'm sorry we couldn't get to. So please uh, do come up and ask your questions. Uh, and I hope that we can continue the conversation on, um, on the value of making what we know public knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.